Here comes the sun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> it's not bad, eh? My pronouns are he, him. I study physics. A virus is alive? Is the question, are we alone? Does it change or is it any less or more important when you begin talking about the multiverse? Yeah, I think that's a really important question because when you say, are we alone? You say, are we alone in the room? Are we alone on Earth? Are we alone in the solar system? So in other words, the how big is the space that you're willing to talk about are you asking the question about? And this one is a multiverse, and so you know that's kind of like at the boundaries of what we think we know. So the question is, uh, well, usually we say, are we alone in the universe is what we really imply. But we don't, sometimes we don't say in the universe. But here I've explicitly put in in the multiverse, and the truth is we're not sure about the multiverse. The people who study the earliest aspects of, of the universe, it suggests that there may be other universes. Mm. But also the data suggests that the our universe could be infinite. In which case, here's our observable universe, here's our observable universe, and let's suppose that there are aliens over here and, and we're the only ones in here, well then we would be alone in our universe, but not in the entire universe, which includes parts of it we can't see. Yeah. So there is a, an important distinction there to be made, and so it's an important point that kind of reverberates through the whole course. Mm. And it sort of comes back to the question of, are we trying to contact these people? Yes, yeah. Because the multiverse, like, can you, even if you're so far apart, can you contact these people? And I mean, so far, we haven't. Well, yeah, but isn't that an interesting variety of being alone? For example, you could, let's say we can predict that they exist, but we can also predict that they'll be outside of our observable universe. Mm -hmm. And so we'll be, we won't be alone in the entire universe, but we'll be alone in the observable universe. So there's a different variety there, right? Yeah. Or does it make it any more or less important? Well, it depends on whether you want to contact them or not. For example, if, if you could only communicate with, let's suppose that there are aliens in the nearest galaxy, two million light years away. You can communicate with, the, with light beams, and, um, but it takes two million years to get a recall. It's kind of like being on the hold for a very long time, mm -hmm. two million years, and then they get an answer. Now, is that being alone? That's for some people say, oh, that's, I'm alone. I'm, for all practical purposes, I'm alone because it takes so long to communicate. On the other hand, if you knew you were going to, if you were an entity that could live for billions of years, then you don't mind waiting a, you know, a couple of million years for a response. Mm. So it really depends on how fast you're thinking and how impatient you are, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> it's a lot of patience for a billion years. Thales is recognized for breaking from the use of mythology. He tried to explain the world and the universe with theories and hypotheses. When I read that, I was sort of, con not confused, but what's the difference between myth and the scientific method? Isn't the scientific method just a more organized version of a shared myth? Like, could the idea of a shared myth sort of whole, like civilization could be seen as one shared myth and we all share it as uh, we have a society, we have democracy, they could be shared myths. But I mean, all these myths, aren't they just trying to make sense of the world? And then aren't scientific methods just trying to make sense of the world? So what sort of distinguishes them? Well, well I, would push back, could, yeah. I would push back to, by saying, do you think there's a difference between the natural and the supernatural? Hmm. One is to be believed, but one has more evidence. <laughs> <laughs> well, supernatural, you know, ghosts and, and I guess a lot of gods in various religions, mm -hmm. um, and that's supernatural. But natural is what we scientists talk about. We don't do supernatural. We can't, in a scientific paper, you can't invoke, yeah, probably God decided to do this or that. You'll never see in a scientific paper about God deciding to do that. And so part of the origin of science is pushing out God from the explanations that we have for lightning, for thunder, for disease, for stars, you know, for, for almost anything. So I think the origin of science is in that separation, putting a wedge between the supernatural and the natural. That's not a wedge that was ever there before, as far as I can tell, because when I look at people, when I've been to countries in which people are really believing in the, their religions, in other words, secular society was kind of invented, and that by these Greeks, when they said, hey, let's try to get explanations that are not, do not invoke gods or the supernatural in any way. And that's what I guess I mean. Um, you, I mean, some people say, oh, science is a myth, but uh, these are, we have some things that are really, we really try hard to push out supernatural explanations, and that's how I would, I would suggest that that started happening with the Greeks about 500 BC or so. Mm. Yeah, it's just sort of what you see the definition of a myth, because if it's just a collection of stories, then science could be just a, and then maths is the language 
where you sort of share that, those stories and try to make sense of the world. I mean, the natural could be also a myth that we see for ourselves. On that, I actually had a, another question that I wrote down that was, so since we're looking back, because you mentioned how we were looking back 2,000 years and saying, oh, that's so not true, I can't believe they thought that, or things like that. What do you think in 2,000 years people will be looking back at what we're doing now and what do you think they'll think is just crazy? Condescension seems to be a constancy. I know. Yeah. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, they had no idea. Oh, my gosh. The, 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 Black they matter. They, they, yeah. <laughs> so Dark if matter. science separated the natural from the supernatural, probably in 2,000 years they'll have something else realized. For example, mm -hmm. what are the supernatural aspects of what we now consider to be civilization and secular. I think, for example, the idea of self and the idea mm. of free will are things that are supernatural, but we take them for granted, and so we include them as part of science or we don't question them. But that's another topic. Yeah. <laughs> that's later in the course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought when you said, are we alone, I think it's an important question to ask, what do you mean? Yes, that's what, what the whole course is about. As a matter of fact, half the course is trying to figure out what does that question mean. So if we did find life, mm. What are the chances that we'd be able to know that we're looking at it or anything? Yeah, I, th I think that is uh, that problem is underestimated by most people looking for life. I have to admit that the answers to how important the question of are we alone mm -hmm. were interesting. They were very varied and they showed a lot of different backgrounds. You saw some people said, it's the most important yeah. thing ever, and other people said, get the hell out of here, it's yeah. stupid, get out of my face. It's, so. Yeah. I Why think. do you find that variety interesting? Because hopefully you think it's important. Mm. Yeah. I've kind of selected you two guys <laughs> to think it's important, so it's a little bit of a biased sample we got here. Just a little. <laughs> but uh, let's try to imagine, can we, let's, all three of us, can we imagine that it's not important at all? Because, uh, you know, it's not, we're going to change what we're going to eat for dinner tonight. I was going to say, it doesn't, yeah. it's not going to help me undo a bolt or anything. It's in terms of undo practicality. Bolt. Is that an important thing for you, undoing bolts? I mean, it is what you need to do it. <laughs> but no, uh, in terms of its cult, no, the practical importance is debatable, but the cultural importance is colossal. Practical? Hey, wait a minute. If, if us discuss, you know, it's very important that, I think it's very important that we find li other life before it finds us. <laughs> because if, that's you know, a, there's a, some historical precedent here about it's better to find than to be found. That is uh, now I'm not quite pretty sure that brutally <laughs> accurate. Yeah, I what do you have think, to Greg? admit. Well, I've asked my friends. Oh, I've been telling my friends from back home. I I go to them. I say, oh, this is like so cool. It's like scientific discovery. Asking whether or not there's life out there. And then some of them just say, like, but I, I really just don't care. Like, they are smart individuals. They are mm -hmm. very competent, and, but they just don't care. It doesn't impact them. The importance of it in terms of practicality, I think, is going to get, well, it could get more useful. But it's interesting what questions it leads us to ask in order to try and answer it more than the answer itself sometimes. Well, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's, it's kind of like, it's a very fertile philosophical issue, yeah. but it also might be the most important question ever and the most <laughs> useful one. That's, because because that's you, guys gonna, you guys are probably going to live for another 50 years, maybe 60 years, and during your lifetime, we might find life elsewhere. And then it becomes the question, okay, if it's bacteria, Do we find it? whew, it's not going to kill us. <laughs> or... Oh, we're going to the te technological civilization that is going to just wipe you out because you've never thought about us before. Okay, we only value civilizations that have asked this question. I'll be like, <laughs> <laughs> so are you saying it could suddenly become very, very important? Yes, of course, of course. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I, I mean, Jared Diamond, for example, and others have talked about, you know, you're an American Indian, you're sitting there doing your good stuff, and then, you know, along comes some ships. Say, oh, oh. <laughs> You know, or in Australia, yes, the other day was Australia Day. Uh-oh, they have found us, and then now what's going to happen? So let's summarize. What do you think of the first week? I thought it was really interesting. I really liked the introductions and surveys of all the people from all different walks of life, Not, and then also the experts, which was very interesting, and all their differing opinions um, based on where they came from. Um, was also very interesting. Mm, so experts don't really agree. <laughs> yeah, which I love because you see how much your field of study influences you. And I think uh, who was I think it was um, Stephen Dick who said uh, that you have to acknowledge your like your preconceptions and yes, where you're coming yeah, from. Yes. So 
to have the experts yeah, sort he's, of he's like that. the world expert yeah. in the history of our understanding of the question mm -hmm. are we alone That's very cool so, yes <laughs> and is wolfram he's head of wolfram yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes that was that was cool as well <laughs> yeah <laughs> the one and only yeah yes and you and you do know that there are, are long videos that you can look, click on now for the full videos how about you what did you think of the uh, honestly, I'm excited for the course. Some of the topics I'm looking forward to diving into a bit more deeply. Okay, so this it sounds like you're, you're propagandizing for the course. What's what's bad about that? What what was the worst thing about week one? Oh yes, there was too long of the scantily clad women getting uh, taken away by aliens and the hero rescuing them. There's, oh, yeah. All right, right. I I was aware of the situation after about three slides. Week one centered around the question, are we alone, right? Did, or the introduction um, to it. Yes, yes. I suppose the whole course centers around, are we alone, hey? Um, so obviously we keep asking, are we alone? And I noticed you kept saying, are we alone in the universe? My question is, in a universe that, as far as we can tell, probably infinite, we know that the development of life is not imposs impossible because we're here. Okay, I'll, I'll stop you there. Oh, okay. Now, do you think the development of English is impossible? Or is possible because we speak in English right now? Well, yeah, yeah it's, it's pr So do you think that we sh even in an infinite universe, we will have um, English speakers out there? It's a distinct possibility in my mind. That, pe that aliens speak English? Yes, but they would have to be so far away that they effectively don't exist. Okay, so you subscribe to the physicist's idea that you have a set of permutations, and as long as you have a large enough set, one of and a, a very, very, very low probability mm -hmm. uh, event will happen. Yeah. Okay. Monkeys with typewriters. Okay. So this yeah. is the idea that. Uh, so what about a set of measure zero? Could it be the case that uh, that English or humans or the type of technology we're talking about um, could be a set of measure zero? What do you mean by set of measure zero? Well, you know the rational numbers embedded mm -hmm. in the real numbers? Mm -hmm. That's a set of measure zero. You take an okay. infinitely sharp knife and go like this, the probability of landing on a rational number, even though they're an infinite number, is zero. Okay. Because they're so few compared to the real numbers. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the mathematical analogy that I'm wondering could be appropriate to our existence, maybe even life. Or pro and most people would agree that English is probably in that set because... Mm -hmm. It's such, so many historical contingencies went into it that it's all random, 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 random. In other words, it's history rather than physics. In physics, you used to talk about statistics and events and independent events with probabilities, but hardly ever, almost never, probability set of measure zero. Mm -hmm. And you and your assumptions excluded that. Okay. So I guess the answer is, well, of course, the question, are we alone, does depend on in this room, in the Earth, in the solar system, in our observable universe, in the infinite spatial universe, maybe in, in other observable universe, and you want to say, well, if we're, in, if we're alone in our universe and over there in another universe, there's somebody, are we alone? And of course, it depends on how you feel. Mm -hmm. Some people feel that they're alone on Earth. Why? Because they don't talk to, they don't have a dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's, that's my answer to that one. Fair enough. You happy with that or not? Um, yes, I am. I, yeah. I, I obviously didn't consider the set of measure zero. Jochen says that he's not convinced that if we find life on other planets in our solar system, that it would have developed independently yeah. from the life here on Earth. Yes. So I've heard of this, I've heard of this concept before, and I think it's called panspermia. Yes, yes it is, but the, you have to be careful, you have to distinguish between two types of panspermia. One is panspermia within our solar system, mm -hmm. and panspermia coming from another star. Coming from another star is much less likely, but coming from another planet in our solar system, particularly during the first half a billion years when there's lots of buses transporting those back and forth because boom, 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 there goes boom, then rock goes up in the air, goes flies all over the inner solar system, and then occasionally that will land on, on other rocky bodies. And if that other rocky body has a little bit of water and a little bit of sunshine, it's got some you know, CO2, then, hey, it's good here too. Mm. And so that's why a lot of, some of my colleagues think that we are Martians. Why? Because there are some arguments that say that Mars might have been more habitable and that the origin of life would have been easier there earlier on, and then boom, 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 it spread to Earth. So that type of panspermia is certainly plausible. A lot of people, I, I think, I, I agree with that statement anyway. Understood. But just but, to just to but. <laughs> no, not but. Just to clarify <laughs> but, the but no but but please push back. But just to clarify the timeline. Yeah. You it's a, it was about the first it was about half a billion years during which the 
solar system was more active and, and Earth and Mars and planetary buildings were being bombarded. Well, regularly. they were bombarded continually. Con it's just, mm -hmm. con just slow downturn yeah. in it, but the first half a billion years were the most active. Mm -hmm. And the, the earliest evidence we have of life on Earth, does that overlap with that period? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. the, the, well, it's a kind of controversial because there's something called the late heavy bombardment, which I think is not scientifically backed up, but most of my colleagues think it is. That ended, that was about 3.9, 3.8 billion years ago. Mm -hmm. And so right after that, up, up until recently, people have said, oh, right after that, then you could have life. But the idea that we can see the traces of life in 4.1 billion year old zircons mm -hmm. is suggestive that, hey, you know, this, this late heavy bombardment maybe wasn't as heavy as, or, or all uh, ubiquitously sterilized in the earth mm -hmm. um, as we thought. And uh, so... Anyway, what was the question that, anyway, we have evidence for it, but that's, could easily, life could easily have started 4.2, 4.3 mm -hmm. in heavy bombardment. Maybe you need heavy bombardment to get life started. So we know, we know so little about the origin of life that we're waving our hands here. But the date about, uh, that's why I quote, hey, the date of the origin of life on Earth is about 4 billion years. And that's certainly well into the interval where there's lots of transportation mm -hmm. between Mars and Earth and Venus and the Moon. I think you might have revealed a bit of your own bias when you were talking to um, Martin Rees. No, I have no bias, as you know that. No, yes, no. You're, a, you're a perfect, perfect teacher. Um, <laughs> that was a bit harsh. Think, that was think, harsh, I'm you sorry. Think, you, think, you think there's a way to get rid of biases? Anyway, no, no, no. So um, you ask him, as the head of an oversight committee for a $100 million program, you don't care whether it succeeds or not. Mm -hmm. Now, the use of the word succeeds here is very interesting to mm -hmm. me, because I know you're a man who's precise with your words. Mm -hmm. Try to be. Yes. Um, succeeding means that it must that extraterrestrial life must be out there and it's able to pick it up right well or, I, yeah I'm, I'm relating mm -hmm. to the people involved in this project are what I would call SETI optimists or mm -hmm. ET optimists and that is they're pretty convinced they're not out there to just test in a neutral way they are convinced that they're out there and success would then be detecting what is okay. out there they belong to that camp and I'm put that's what I'm teasing a little bit okay and how do, you, how do you fall there? Uh, do you think that SETI has any realistic chance of observing evidence of extraterrestrial life within our lifetimes? Well, I'm, I'm a big supporter of SETI, mm -hmm. but I'm a, 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 giant, a big underminer of the idea that there, is li there are life forms out there that have followed the same, well, followed any track that would lead to radio telescopes and what we would call technological civilization. That's, mm -hmm. most people assume, hey, they talk about civilization, civilization. As soon as people talk about civilizations out there, they've assumed kind of like a linearity to evolution that I don't see any evidence for in the evolution of life on Earth.